Okay, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, it's great to see your smiling faces out there. Um, and we're so happy to have you. Uh, so just a note before we begin, my name uh, is Sister Colleen Gibson. I'm a Sister St. Joseph of Philadelphia, and I'm going to act kind of as our facilitator tonight, moderate our conversation. Um, but really, this is an opportunity to hear from Phyllis on the work that she's done to learn about women deacons and, and how that really intersects with our lives as women religious. Uh, and then really, it's an opportunity for conversation. So we're really going to open up the floor for question and answer. So we've done a couple of these webinars with the general public, and we thought it was important to, to open it up to a group of just women religious. And so we've kind of we've tried to work out the kinks over a few sessions. And so, uh, but today will be recorded and that will be released in case uh, anyone isn't able to make it, anybody wants to follow up and watch later. Uh, another note is that um, we have a couple of members, Rose and Catherine Fisher are both on uh, this call and they're from the Hofstra educational tech team. Uh, so they're just kind of supervising and making sure uh, that Zoom doesn't crash or anything like that. Uh, and then a final note, so kind of the structure for our evening tonight is going to be two parts. Phyllis will offer some input uh, briefly, and then we'll really open up the floor for a question and answer. And I have some questions that I've received ahead of time, um, but otherwise we're going to take questions from you. And so if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a chat function. And so you can type in any questions that you might have along the way. Uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of act as the voice of the group because there's a lot of people on this call and I'll pose those to Phyllis. So hopefully that all makes sense and we're, we're all on the same page. Uh, so just by way of introduction, um, you probably know a little bit about Phyllis, but I'll give you a little bit of a bio. So uh, Phyllis Zagano is the Senior Research Associate in Residence in the Department of Religion at Hofstra University. She's an award-winning author and the editor of 20 books in religious studies. She's the author of Women Deacons, Past, Present, and Future from Paulus Press. Uh, and she writes for the National Catholic Reporter and a number of other places. Uh, she's an internationally acclaimed Catholic scholar and lecturer on contemporary spirituality and women's issues in the church. Uh, when we get to the end of our webinar tonight, she will tell you about all the wonderful places that you can hear her speaking uh, and that you can tap into the work that she's doing. And most recently, uh, in August of 2016, she was appointed by Pope Francis to the Papal Commission for the Study of Women in the Diaconate, uh, which submitted its study to Pope Francis uh, earlier this year. And so... Many of you may have watched her on the panel at Fordham University, and many of you may have been on the webinars uh, that we've been having as the year began. So we're so happy to have you here tonight to join in this conversation, and we welcome your questions along the way. Uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Phyllis to give us just a little bit of input to begin. Well, thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Yes, as Colleen said, we've been doing this a little bit. We've had two general webinars we had one practice and then two general webinars. Uh, and uh, can, the conversation is very good, but the conversation always there's one uh, woman religious, whether I give a talk or I give a, uh, 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 a webinar, there's one woman religious who, uh, only one who gets to ask a question. So we thought that it'd be a good idea to have uh, more sisters, more, one just for sisters. And that, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, you probably want to hear about the commission. The, uh, the commission itself uh, met for the first time in uh, November of 2016. I was appointed in August of 2016, and uh, we met in um, November, and then we met a couple of times. I, I actually lived in the, in the Holy Father's house for four and a half months of the past two and a half years. And uh, that was because I had funding from the Hilton Fund for Sisters, so I could stay in Rome for a longer amount of time. And I volunteered at the first meeting to be everybody's teaching assistant. So that's what I did. I went to the library and I, I read everything I'd seen before. And, and uh, anyway, we met. Uh, it's uh, public knowledge now that we have uh, given a, a report to the Holy Father. 
and uh, that's that's all I know. Uh, at Fordham University, January 15th, uh, Father Bernard Poitier was in from Belgium, myself, Sister Donna Ciangio, who's the Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Newark, uh, and, and I were on a panel at Fordham, and we, uh, 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 Father Poitier and I, uh, were able to tell people that the Holy Father has a report. I have no idea what's going to happen next. I really don't. Uh, but as I said at Fordham, um, if I were the Holy Father, I would not want to walk into the um, International Union of Superiors General Meeting in May without an answer. So I don't know what will happen, uh, but it is uh, the International, uh, the, the UISG, the International Union of Superiors General, who nominated me. So that's also part of the reason um, that I'm saying thank you to you all because I got there. I can tell you that the commission had 12 people, uh, six men and six women. Uh, and it's the first commission in the history of the church. It's the first major uh, deliberative body in the history of the church that was 50% male and 50% female. Uh, I know that uh, of the, uh, the eight nominees for the, from UISG, uh, I was one and there were two others, Sister Mary Maloney, the, the rector of uh, the Antonianum, and Sister uh, Miria Kalduk, who's a professor of uh, biblical studies at the uh, Pontifical uh, Gregorian. So, uh, and, and I can tell you more if you want to know who was on it. But uh, <clears throat> so we met, we talked, uh, we made a report, uh, and I don't know what will happen next. Uh, the, uh, the history of women deacons, however, is clear. Uh, women were ordained as deacons. Uh, women did serve as deacons, w women ministered as deacons, women did diaconal things. Uh, I'll, uh, Colleen mentioned I'll be speaking elsewhere. Um, I'll be in California next week and uh, at Los Angeles Religious Education Congress, and I, I, I've been writing my talks. Um, we know women deacons ministered at the altar because beginning in the fifth century, Pope Gelasius I started complaining about it. And uh, we have evidence for about a thousand years, well, not a thousand years, it's about six, eight hundred years, um, that uh, popes and bishops are, are complaining that females are touching sacred vessels uh, and uh, touching sacred vestments, touching the pall, um, actually to offering the blood of Christ in, in the chalice to people. And of course, this is considered disgraceful at the time and perhaps even now. Um, but women deacons did uh, participate in the anointing at baptism. It's possible they also uh, participated in chrismation, which is the ancient church's uh, equivalent of, uh, of uh, uh, confirmation. I, and I think that the, uh, the other sacraments that, that we know they, they, we, we know they anointed women. Uh, we, we know they anointed ill women. Uh, we know they brought the Eucharist to ill women. And it makes sense because no man would touch a woman he wasn't um, married to, basically, uh, or a child. Uh, no man would be alone with uh, any woman he wasn't related to. Um, there, there's a wonderful document I read about baptism and... <laughs> and I, I've actually been in a, a baptismal pool. It's, it's a big kind of about six feet around, concentric stone circles, and um, uh, there are no railings, and it's hard to get in and out. So if you're participating in baptism it, and, you, and you're unclothed or just with a simple veil and you're going to be anointed, you need somebody to help you. That's my point. Uh, and one document I read said that the whole event when women were involved was covered by a curtain, and the bishop would just kind of um, stick his hand through and, and, and bless the individual um, because he couldn't look. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the, the practices in the early church, as well as the culture, required women to, um, uh, required women to, um, required women to, uh, to, uh, um, required women to minister in this way. I mean, that, that's basically it. Um, I, I'm having people, I'm seeing chats that, that people can't hear. I would say if you can't hear, um, kind of uh, turn up your, your sound. Um, 
but if you uh, are not muted, uh, please mute, okay? So, so that's kind of it. Uh, the ministry of, of, the, of deacons today are, um, are similar uh, to what women deacons did in the past. The, the deacons of today uh, can preach. Uh, they baptize, they witness marriages. They manage funeral exequaries. They, they, they manage a lot of the diaconal task. Here we go. Why don't you, uh, uh, we can start with some of your questions and uh, we can see if some questions come in. Sure. Um, yeah, so if, if you've been thinking of some questions or you have some questions in, in particular for Phyllis, feel free to type them in. Um, but maybe Phyllis, if you could talk in general about, you know, the ministry of ordained deacons. And I know you talked about early on, women deacons were really helped because really helped because they could, you know, bodily touch women. And that was part of the role that they played. But looking at the history from, you know, the earliest stages of women deacons to the present, what is the role of a, of a deacon? Well, the deacon today is, it's, I, I think people are pretty much uh, knowledgeable, at least in the United States. I know we have, we have sisters actually from Africa on, but uh, um, the deacon today, it's almost kind of reversed in a way. And, and I think the diaconate has gotten a bad, uh, has gotten a bad, a bad rep uh, because, because the, uh, the deacon, uh, the deacon today, it's almost reversed. The deacon is seen as a sacramental minister. Uh, but, but that really, the sacramental ministry part, particularly the participation in the Mass, is, is something that uh, is ceremonial, it's representative. So the good news is, if we had women deacons, the, the church would be putting its money where its mouth is, so to speak. It, it would be declaring that women are made in the image and likeness of Christ. Now, I have been told in Rome, that women cannot image Christ. And I, I get a little annoyed at that. It's heretical, <laughs> aside from the fact it's heretical, you know, for further information, please see number 48 in the Baltimore Catechism. But, but you know, the, the, uh, the fact of the matter is that the deacons, uh, the first generation of deacons, who were probably in the United States who were about the third generation of deacons, but the first generation of deacons um, Unfortunately, was not that was not that uh, uh, was not that uh, well trained. The first generation of deacons, uh, unfortunately, was not that well selected. I uh, long chat with the deacon director today in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, and it's a huge process now. Uh, interestingly enough, seven years. Uh, uh, so if, you know, as as you well know, seven years to vows, but also seven years to be a law partner. So you know, figure out where that comes from. But, um, uh, but the deacon today is, and again, it depends, depends on, the, on the diocese. Um, we need to, to, they need, we need to understand it's not just functionality, it's not just what they can do, uh, but rather who they are and what they should do. Uh, so deacons can be assigned to all sorts of, uh, of uh, different, uh, all sorts of different uh, ministries, prison ministry in, in Toronto, for example, a deacon has his home parish and also has an official ministry. Um, but uh, the deacon now is known because he will hear and he will preach. He will, uh, it, during the Mass, uh, what he can do during the Mass, what he does during the Mass, very interesting. He's the go-between the, um, uh, he's the go-between the, um, the priest and the people. Um, he handles the sacred vessels. He, he receives, you know, in the old, old church, you had the procession of the deacons bringing, bringing the gifts to the altar. Now we call it a, uh, uh, a uh, offertory procession. Uh, but, and then the deacon is, is part of returning the gifts to the people of God to, uh, by specifically ministering uh, the cup. The deacon proclaims the gospel first. The deacon can preach. Um, the deacon is the one who uh, uh, asks the people to receive the blessing of the priest and also proclaims that the, uh, the Mass is ended. So, so all of these, these ceremonial things, however, um, really make sense when the deacon is involved with social service ministry because the ministry of the deacon is the word, the liturgy, and charity. 
and and to to disconnect them is to uh, create kind of a uh, uh, you know a, a, it's just not right you know and that that's part of the impetus for for women deacons if if women if we have women deacons already women are doing social service ministries already the women are running the catechesis already the women are the spiritual directors already the women um are, are the pastoral associates already the women are in prison ministry already the women are running the soup kitchens i want to hear the women preaching on sunday i want to hear the women uh proclaiming the gospel um and 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 speaking to me from their weeks experience how the gospel has has informed informed what uh, uh, what what their ministry is, and I think that's so important, Phyllis. The the two pieces, you know, the liturgical and really the charitable or the service piece that deacons serve. And we have a question here from Andrea. Um, actually, it's it's two questions. You know, what would you see as the advantages for women religious to have deacons in their communities? And then the second part. Um, She's from a monastic community. And so what liturgical functions uh, could a, a deacon take on in a, mon in a monastic community? Well, I think, I think Andrea, the, the, um, the, the liturgical functions in, in a monastic community, historically, um, the, the abbess deacon was the heavy. And she would would run uh, would would uh, manage um, the liturgical schedule. Um, I don't think there'd be much difference, except uh, for the question of preaching. And then, depending on whether you're in a territorial abbey or not, it, you get into a big canonical discussion over whether um, the abbess has can uh, give preaching faculties to a sister within the territorial abbey. Um, certainly in women's communities, uh, women religious preach uh, and they, they, they preach at, but basically at private masses, at private ceremonies, uh, whether it's a funeral or, or a celebration of vows. Um, and, and it's not a public funeral or a public uh, cere uh, ceremony. The, the, can, the law uh, of, of the church is that a bishop cannot give, he cannot give uh, faculties for preaching to anyone other than a cleric within the same, uh, cel within the same um, liturgy. So uh, uh, the Benedictines, which Andrea is one, you know, have a, have a, a long history actually of, of deacon abbesses um, and I I just don't I I don't think, but I don't think it would be any different because uh, in history the the deacon abbess was also able to um, nominate you'll love this nominate one of her sisters to hear confessions um, some of the senior sisters to hear confessions you see that the second rule for virgins the the first rule it's not the rule for nuns Caesarius of Arles in the uh, in the uh, sixth century created a wrote a, a rule for for virgins um and and we think of it now or we call it the rule for nuns the second rule for nuns included uh that the abbess uh, would be required to hear confessions now now that goes far and away from uh from diaconal work now uh, but it was the Gregorian reform really in the, in the 12th century that got rid of deacons hearing confessions. So, so that, there's a question for you. Uh, but, but basically, Andrea, I don't, um, you know, I don't like questions of functionality, but within the monastery, um, within the monastery, I don't think things would be that different. Um, although they would be able to, and depending on the, on the, uh, the, the, tradition of the monastery, the practice of the monastery, uh, they would be able to more formally participate in the mass. I guess that's the, that's the easiest way to think about it. So, Colleen? Yeah, uh, here's a question from Carol Phyllis um, about your work, well, about the work of the commission, but also uh, the Union International of Superior Generals, the UISG. Um, have you been in contact with their leadership about pursuing this topic if they don't hear anything 
before the meeting in Rome in early May? Um, well, there's two questions. Uh, I, I, was on, I was on the phone with the leadership of UASJ yesterday. I mean, I do, I do talk to them a lot. Um, they're the ones that, that uh, got me over there. Uh, I, I don't know. I know the Holy Father is scheduled to speak to them on May 10th at noon. Uh, I don't know anything else. Um, uh, but they have an awful lot of other stuff going on. They're, they're, they're projects about trafficking. They are doing diaconal work. Um, you know, this is just a piece of it. Uh, what happened, how it came about, how the whole commission came about is the, um, the sisters last in three years ago on May 12th, 2016, were, were, going, were asked or were able to submit six questions to the Holy Father. They went to their, um, they went to their constellations. There are 36, const they call them constellations. We have regions in the United States. They have constellations, 36 around the world. They went to the constellations and they asked them um, to submit questions. I think each constellation was able to submit one question. They ended up with 26 entries. And from the 26, this is told to me by Carmen Samet, the president of uh, UISG, the, um, they boiled down the 26. They were able to use pretty much everything uh, into the six questions. Um, so the first question was, well, what about women in leadership? And by the way, what about women preaching? And the second question was, you know, well, women religious are doing the work of the diaconate. What about uh, a commission to restore the female diaconate? So that, that's how it all happened. And the Holy Father was, uh, was very forthcoming on the first point, he said, absolutely, we need more women in leadership. He, he said, and I, it's really a, a brilliant uh, uh, comment that I've been reflecting on today. We need, uh, when we have decision making, we need to have male and female input. Uh, that women see things, his words were, women see things through different eyes. I, I think it's just beautiful. And then he said, well, on preaching, um, uh, only the priests can preach because uh, women can't be priests. And of course that drives me wild because whenever you ask about the diaconate, they say, well, women can't be priests. I said, well, we're not talking about the priesthood, we're talking about the diaconate. And that problem, the problem of priesthood is because of, again, the Gregorian reform in the 12th century, when uh, a thing called the cursus honorum, the course of honor was codified. And, and um, so, so no one began these steps and, and you had to go through each step. No one began these steps. No one was tonsured. Uh, no one became a porter. No one became a, oh goodness. No one became a, um, no one became a, uh, a lector or an acolyte. No one entered any of these, uh, these uh, uh, steps unless he was destined to be a, uh, a priest. So, so that's how women stopped being ordained as deacons, even deacon abbesses, because women were never in the cursus honorum. So if you were not going to be a priest, you were not ordained a deacon. Although we know, Otto of, of Lucca in north of Italy, we know he had women deacons up until the, the 11th century. So um, uh, I don't know. I hope that answers your question. I, I, I uh, uh, talk to UISG about a lot of things. Obviously, we talk about um, we talk about the diaconate, but uh, you know, I, I I don't know what they're doing over there uh, in this respect. Uh, Phyllis, in terms of women religious as women deacons and and that connection, one of the questions that often comes up uh, is about really. Uh, who has authority over deacons, or who would have authority over women deacons? So could you speak a little bit about that? You know, I'll tell you, I get this question every single time. There's always one sister in the in the group who wants to know about, about the question of authority. And I, I can tell you it's been a discussion uh, that I've been involved in for, I, it's got to be 25 years. If, if Mary Milligan, a religious sacred daughter Mary, was the uh, was the general superior, but she was also the provincial in the West. And she said, I don't want a bishop telling me where to assign my sisters. <laughs> I was like, well, he can't. 
<laughs> you know? um, uh, the the easy question is uh, the easy part of it is just just ask a Jesuit. Um, the authority uh, within a religious community rests in the president, and provincial priors. Should a sister wish to study to be a deacon, she has to get the permission of the president, president or prioress or or provincial. Um, that entails another question because the council itself would need to determine whether it wished to become an institute that was mixed clerical and lay. But for the diaconate, it's not that complicated. Um, it is complicated for the priesthood, but it's not complicated at all for the, uh, for the diaconate. Um, so uh, if we, uh, uh, if, so if the sister gets permission to study um, and she studies, uh, she then still has to get permission from her um, superior to be ordained. And then she's ordained. Well, she's ordained, say, in Philadelphia, um, and she has faculties from the Archbishop of Philadelphia. Uh, but the Archbishop of Philadelphia cannot assign her any place. It is up to the Sister Superior to assign her. So if the Philadelphia Sister is then assigned by the, prov the provincial or the president or the prioress to New Jersey, she then has to get faculties and get approval from New Jersey. It's, it's, it's almost like um, if you're a physician and you have a, a license from the Commonwealth of, uh, of uh, Philadelphia, a Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you then have to get your um, uh, medical license uh, reviewed and get licensed in New York if you're mission to New York. So, so the authority rests in the Institute, um, not not with the bishop for women religious for seculars obviously they're incarnated in in a diocese but women religious are incarnated uh in in their institutes phyllis um do you think one of the other things that's come up in terms of religious congregations and having women deacons and so deacons and then sisters who are not ordained to diaconate uh, is there a fear that that could create a hierarchy within the congregation? You know, um, I, I don't think so. Um, I think that, uh, I think that you have a situation where women religious have figured it out. I, I, I've, I've spoken with at length with, um, his name just went out of my head, but with the Franciscan, uh, uh, the Franciscan uh, uh, general superior, uh, friars are friars, and whether they're priests or not, they're friars. And um, the movement now is uh, is to have uh, the Franciscans at least be able to have a uh, a guardian uh, who is not a priest. Uh, with the diaconate, it's different, okay? With the diaconate, uh, canon lawyers tell me that there's no need to have the, um, uh, the abbess or the uh, provincial or president ordained as a, as a deacon. So, um, but the authority definitely rests in the general superior, not, not with the bishop. There's absolutely no, uh, um, you know, the, Canon law really draws walls around convents, and and uh, it's very clear uh, what the bishop can and cannot do in relation to uh, to religious uh, to religious institutes. So, uh, I, I I I I I think that's a uh, that's a that's a moot point. It really is. Yeah, I think as a follow up to that, Phyllis, we have a question from Sandy, and she says, "Can you?" Talk a little bit more about what the relationship of a woman religious to the bishop is, given the relationship of a deacon to the bishop. Well, well, it's it's uh, apples and oranges in a way. A, a cleric who is incarnated in a diocese uh, is in obedience to the bishop. A woman religious is in obedience to her institute through the president, prioress, abbess, provincial. Um, so so that, I'm, I'm talking about a woman religious who would be a deacon. Uh, what? 
yeah what what we are um i just muted you sandy um but but women religious who are deacons would be licensed by the um uh would be licensed by the bishop to work but she wouldn't i mean how can i say if a woman religious was a deacon working in a parish and decided to um tell the priest to use chocolate chip cookies for mass it would be the it would be the bishop who would come in and say you can't do that uh it would be the bishop who gives faculties it would be the bishop who gives um um it would be the bishop who uh, retracts faculties uh but uh i mean that's that's about it colleen Do we lose Colleen? Yep, I'm here. <laughs> um, there's a, a question that comes up often about, you know, the work of the deacon uh, is work that women religious are already doing. Um, and so would women religious being able to be ordained as deacons, would that just ritualize uh, the work that's already being done? Or what difference would that make in the view of women in the church? What do you think? Well, I think... You know, uh, what we didn't talk about is some of the some of the meetings we've had where where we uh, uh, we were um, uh, talking with women religious under the age of forty, and uh, one of the things that came out from one of those meetings was the 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 fact that they feel that the possibility of women being ordained as deacons would not um, would not create a, a big rush to convents for people to be deacons. Uh, it might create a big rush for people to con for people to convents to be religious because they would see that the church uh, believes um, uh, it, what it says about women. It would it would show that there's a more respect for women, um, not only for women as as women, but for women's intellect and 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 uh, uh, and women's abilities. So. Um, I, I don't know that it would make uh, a, a big difference, um, but I think, but in another sense, I think it would. I mean, if you consider, if you consider what it would look like to have a woman vested in front of St. Peter's Basilica uh, proclaiming the gospel, uh, what does that say to the rest of the world? I'm just writing today about menstruation huts in Nepal, okay, which are illegal, but there's a whole, there's, there's a, a uh, tradition in my and it's remembered in Micronesia it's remembered in many places of the world in Colombia uh, uh, the Aborigine women uh, in in um, in uh, Australia when they have their first period have to go out into a menstruation hunt hut they can't be near food they can't be near people um, that's what the world has to get rid of this concept that women are unclean and the only way the church can argue what it says it says, that women are clean, that women are not unclean, that is by showing the world that women can touch the sacred, can, can, um, can, can proclaim, can touch the word of God, can, can proclaim the gospel, um, can participate in the ceremonials. I mean, the next time you see a ceremony going on in St. Peter's Basilica, let me tell you, it's very high testosterone. There's not a woman in sight. Uh, and sometimes if there is, she might be a seven-year-old in the offertory procession, or maybe a linguist uh, reading part of the scripture in, in Swahili or, or German or Greek or something. Uh, but it's a man's uh, ceremony. And, and, and that says things to the world. It really does. Um, Christians are only one third of the world. I mean, it's a lot of Christians, okay? There are 2 billion Catholics, but, but, but uh, 1.2 billion Catholics and 2 billion Christians. But Christianity has uh, lagged, I think, uh, perhaps not so much as other, uh, other institutes, but other uh, religions, but Christianity does lag in, um, in, in proclaiming the value of women. Phyllis, in terms of the value of women and the roles that being ordained to the diaconate would open up to women, could you speak a little bit about um, how inclusion in the diaconate would open decision-making roles to women or what, um, 
juridical authority would it give to women that that role of the deacon? Yeah, you know that's that's an interesting thing. When when the Holy Father, when the Holy Father uh, was um, was speaking with UISG, he, he he said a very interesting thing. He said that he said that um, he spoke with a Syrian professor, and and the professor said that when a woman was accusing her husband of beating her, that the bishop would ask a woman deacon to examine the bruises and then testify on behalf of the woman who was beaten. Now, <clears throat> if you fast forward, that's, that's a judgment of nullity. That's, that's a judgment of, um, of a woman deacon being able to tell the bishop, yes, this woman was, was, was beaten. Now, now if you, if you, um, if you think about it, um, today, canon lawyers who are women cannot sign single judgments. No, no woman uh, can sign a single judgment, even a woman canon lawyer, even a woman judge, okay? And in the past two or three years, the Holy Father has changed the rules for annulment so that um, it's single judge, no second instance, which means even if a woman canon lawyer does the paperwork, she has to get a cleric to sign it. She can't sign it. She's not a cleric. And, um, and there's no second instance. So there's really no opportunity for a woman um, to make the judgment, uh, to render a judgment of nullity on behalf of the bishop. So in terms of um, jurisdiction, uh, that would be a very big, uh, big thing. Um, there are certain things that clerics can do, certain papers that clerics can sign. Um, uh, I know we have a lot of women chancellors, but there are certain uh, documents that they, they need a co-signature on uh, because they're not clerics. Uh, we, we, have, um, uh, we, we have other instances of, of authority. In, in a way, actually, preaching is a juridical authority because it's done on behalf of the bishop. And as I said earlier, only uh, a cleric participating in a, a given ceremony, uh, in a given liturgy, uh, is allowed to give the homily, formally give the homily. So um, uh, anyway, that, that's, that's, I think, pretty much it. Okay. I have a, a couple more questions. So I just remind anybody out there, if you have questions, feel free to type them in and we will ask them. Um, now, when you look at the research, Phyllis, really, it, the research reveals that, you know, in the world, deacons, 98% of deacons exist in America, in the Americas and in Europe. Um, so how widely accepted do you think um, the female, female deacon would be? And, and what, how would that, how would it work the institution of uh, the diaconate across the world? How would that happen? It's very interesting. As I said earlier, I spent about four and a half months in the, in the House of the Holy Father, and I ate with cardinals and bishops from every place in the world. Um, some places, some of the African bishops were, and cardinals were, uh, one was very annoyed that I was trying to push uh, my American ideas on Africa. I said, nobody's pushing anything on anybody. Um, but the South American bishops were very, very excited. Um, they would love to have women uh, because they had them already. Uh, they, they won uh, Father Sosa, the uh, the head of the uh, sp the Superior General of the Jesuits, Father General of the Jesuits. He said in our, in Venezuela, he knew of a parish with two priests and fourteen <clears throat> little shrines that they had to take care of. That's very very common in South America, and in many places there are women religious up there running those shrines. It would uh, again. It's a question of, of functionality, but it would and and it would be easy easier um, if the woman religious running the shrine were a deacon, because then she could do the wedding, she could do the baptism solemnly, and uh, she also uh, would be rescuing. That's probably a, a strong word. She she would be able to do it so the people would not have to go next door to the evangelicals. Um, that's what's going on in. Uh, in South America, I, I forget the numbers, but they're very high. 
and the uh, the numbers of, of ex Catholics who are now uh, evangelicals are is astronomical, <clears throat> and they don't have they don't have deacons, they don't have priests. Uh, other places in the world, the bishops of Cambodia and Thailand, they said, well, you know, wouldn't bother us, but we don't have educated uh, women. We don't have enough educated women to make them deacons. Uh, in, in France and in Europe, uh, no problem. England, no problem. Ireland, no problem. Um, about half of the Irish bishops uh, don't have women deacons, uh, don't have deacons at all. And for the most part, uh, one of them at least told me, he said he doesn't have uh, deacons because he can't have women deacons. He did not want to establish uh, another level between himself <clears throat> and, and the people who are doing the work who, who are the women. That's very interesting, really. Um, in terms of that, in, in terms of creating a, a division or that, that bishop in particular saying, you know, I don't want to create a division between men and women, so just not have the diaconate at all. Um, do you think that having women religious as deacons or having a female diaconate in general, whether it's women religious or not, um, do you think that could de-emphasize the role of the laity in the church? Well, no, I actually think it might help. Um, I think it might help because not every lay ecclesial minister wants to be a deacon. Not every uh, uh, individual, it, it has to do with vocation. Um, the vocation to religious life and the vocation to the diaconate is separate. Um, uh, what I would see is you have uh, sister teachers, you have sister sociologists, you have sister lawyers, and you have sister deacons. Um, the sisters who work in pastoral ministry, I think, would be uh, very well, um, uh, well able to, to manage uh, the, the co-located uh, vocations should they discern them. Um, but I don't think it would de-emphasize the, the, the laity because, um, because not everybody would be a deacon. The only reason to have deacons is if <laughs> to have women deacons is if you need more deacons. You know, you don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't just go around ordaining people. And in fact, uh, there are all sorts of laws that that you can't just ordain people because you feel like it. Uh, you ordain people because you have a need. Uh, we don't think about that so much uh, these days because there is a great need. Uh, but uh, no, I don't think it would. Uh, uh, another thing they bring up is, oh, clericalizing the lady. We're not clericalizing anybody. Um, uh, every, every profession has clericalism. Uh, doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, and priests. There's all sorts of clericalism that goes on. Um, but there are certain things that a cleric, such as I said earlier, who is a, uh, a judge, for example, a canon lawyer, can do that a non-cleric can't do. The preaching. Um, and, and the answer is not lay preaching, uh, because the preaching is, is a function, uh, it's an extension of the bishop. You know, up till the really 11th, 12th century, only bishops could preach. Um, so it's, it's a big deal now that deacons and, and priests can preach as well. Can you, there was a, as part of your work and part of, um, CARA, the Center for Applied Research and Apostolate, did uh, a survey of major superiors of men and women's religious communities about the women diaconate. Um, and they asked, I thought this was fascinating, you know, they asked LCWR congregations and CMSWR congregations, you know, when you think about your membership, how many members in your institute would be, uh, would be interested in becoming women deacons, if that was an option. Uh, and I was fascinated as I read through the research that um, in CMSWR congregations, it was, uh, the average was under one member in the congregation, but within LCWR congregations, uh, it was 3.2 members. And so uh, I think oftentimes when we talk about the diaconate and female diaconate, we don't think about eligibility requirements. And so uh, could you speak a little bit about that? Because I, it, it surprised me when I read it, uh, but it just, it hadn't occurred to me. So you could speak a little bit about eligibility. Those. Well, yeah. In the early church, um, the first rule was you had to be over 60. And then it got dropped to 40. 
Um, right now, a celibate can be ordained at 25 um, and a married person at 35. And the maximum age is typically about 65. They don't, they don't generally let people into um, formation over the age of 60. And the reason the numbers are so low in the LCWR uh, crowd is because of the uh, demographics. Uh, the group is just too old. And I, I also had meetings with, uh, with general superiors from three LCWR regions and that was personal meetings. We had dinner or lunch. And um, that was the, orig the, the original comment that they made was our sisters are, are generally too old. But every single one of them, to a woman, had someone who either had performed diaconal functions in her institute, I'm thinking of people who were working in northern Canada or in mission work, uh, or they had uh, people who were in their 50s and 60s who'd be willing to, or younger, who were, would be able to be uh, uh, deacons and wanted to be deacons because they were in, uh, in, that, in that ministry. The, um, uh, the bishop can do what he wants, you know? And so if sister is 70 and he wants to ordain her, he can. Uh, uh, it's, there's always the, the waiver. There's, there's always the, you know, the, 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 the waiver from the rules. So, uh, uh, yeah, I was, I was a little surprised at that number, but it was, it was parsed, I think, uh, against the, if I remember the study correctly, it was parsed against the, um, uh, the demographics of the responding institutes. In terms of the CMSM, uh, CMC, C, what is it, CMSC? I forget what. CMSWR. Right. Uh, the, that, the, those sisters are um, pretty traditional. And um, I, I had a Zoom meeting with one of their institutes and I, I found it very interesting. They felt that their habits would suffice for uh, ordination, uh, and that, that's a whole that's a whole another discussion. That wearing a traditional habit made it unnecessary for them to be ordained, um, and uh, because they but they were also of the mindset that father would do the burial, father would do the uh, the uh, preaching, father would do the baptism father would do the uh, the marriage uh, but a very interesting um, uh, that they saw themselves to have have a status you see I see religious life as as ultimately uh, simply a, a way of living the Christian lifestyle but it is a lay life it is it is a, a, a life for lay women um, and I don't think it's fair for the church to uh, uh, to substitute vows for orders. And I think that's done a little too much uh, where um, sisters are asked to work in parishes um, uh, with, without giving them orders. If they're, if they're, if they're asked to do parochial, a parochial duty, I, I think they should be ordained um, a, a, as deacons. And, and so, um, but yes, the whole, the, the, the study about, but you know, it was also interesting that the, I think it returned about 74, 75, something like 79% in some cases. I know with LCWR sisters, 95% felt uh, that women could be ordained, should be ordained. And there was another study uh, of bishops uh, that Kara did, and uh, it turned out that almost 100% of the deacon directors and a smaller percentage of uh, bishops felt that w when all was said and done, yeah, they could use women as deacons. A lot of them didn't think it could happen, should happen, but but if it did happen, they could use them. So, you know, pays your money, it takes your choice. Yeah, and I think so often, you know, uh, deacons who are married, their wives are going through those training classes with them and mm -hmm. like, receiving the same, you know, formation. Yes. Um, they're not receiving the same formation, but they are taking the academic training. You know, formation for orders is, uh, when I taught at Yale, ships, um, spiritual, human, intellectual, and, and pastoral. And, and the, uh, uh, the academic training is what the sisters have to go through, um, not, the, uh, not the, uh, the human formation so much. Uh, 
and uh, but again, it's vocation. You know, um, it's his vocation. Um, there has to be consultation. He can't get ordained just as a sister can't be ordained without the uh, permission of the general superior. A man can't be ordained without his wife's permission. And in in some cases, younger children have to be involved. And and what they you know what do they think uh, about the whole idea? So uh, it's it's a very um, it's a very um, it's very interesting uh, uh, studies, both of them. Um, I, I just wrote a, a, a co-wrote a, a, a refereed paper about some studies about women in the diaconate. And <clears throat> my point in the, in the paper, our point uh, in the paper, is, uh, is that the, the church is, is coming to a new era of synodality, uh, that, that consultation is important. And uh, just as I said earlier, the Holy Father has said consultation is important. Just as I said earlier, this is the first commission in history that was 50% male and 50% female. I just found that out. I, I keep trying to get that through my head. Um, just as those things are true, um, synodality means we look to all ways of asking how the church is thinking. And so the CARA studies, two CARA studies, one of... Um, women in the church report in America magazine, uh, another CARA study of men and women, general, women, uh, general superiors in the United States, uh, and another study of, uh, actually an online study, a non-scientific study from um, US Catholic. All three, um, coinc coincidentally, came between 73 and 78% positive. Uh, on the possibility of women in the diaconate uh, with all sorts of reasons supporting it. So uh, um, I, I, th I think the voice of the church will be, the church at large will be heard um, at some point. I don't know how soon. <laughs> I, when you were speaking, Phyllis, you talked about um, really diaconal formation programs. And I just wonder um, in, in religious congregations and women's religious congregations, who would be in charge of, overseeing or designing those formation programs? Would it be the responsibility of the congregation or would it be the responsibility of, uh, I don't know, the diocese or uh, who would be in charge of that? Yeah, well, generally speaking, it, it's, it's a diocesan formation just as you would, you know, uh, there's a Dominican seminary in St. Louis, you know, so some people go and study there, but there's also a diocesan seminary in Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> Deacon formation programs are typically um, in diocesan seminaries. The curriculum itself is really what you're asking about, not so much where the formation would take place. Um, spiritual, human, intellectual, and, and pastoral formation. Pastoral formation as a deacon would have to be in some kind of a diaconal training uh, program. The human formation is done, I think, in the institute. Uh, the intellectual formation is where you go to school um, and spiritual formation is done in the institute. So um, I, I would look to men's religious institutes on, uh, and orders. Where, where do they send their people? Some of them have their own seminaries. Some of them don't. Some go to diocesan seminaries. I think at the beginning, at least, women religious would be attending diocesan seminaries or places like the Catholic Theological Union. Um, in uh, in Chicago, um, f for want of a better uh, reason, because the the programs are uh, the programs are uh, established. Mm -hmm. That's that's wonderful. We have about uh, five minutes left, Phyllis, and so uh, I know time flies when you're having fun. Uh, so I I don't know if you want one more question or if you want to do some plugs about the things that. You have coming up. What question do you have? I mean, uh, is the see, is the seeming non movement on this issue on women's diaconate is it more of a sign of lack of clarity uh, of women's roles in the church, or is it a sign of lack of clarity about the church's direction in general? Oh, I shouldn't have asked that. Um, <laughs> you don't uh, have to answer that, but you you asked for it, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> thank you, sister. Um, I think. Um, well, I don't know that there's lack of movement. There has been historically. I was thinking earlier today, about 30 years ago, I asked uh, 
uh, Cardinal Ratzinger in person about women deacons, and he said, oh, it's under study. Well, I mean, how long can you study? The history is clear. Women were ordained. I've seen the ceremonies. I've seen the liturgies. Women were sacramentally ordained according to the criteria of the Council of Trent. Um, it's, it's a non-starter, really, the argument. The only argument they have against uh, ordaining women as deacons is uh, women can't image Christ, which, as I said earlier, is heretical. Um, the, the cultural uh, denial of the humanity of females is, is still kind of present in certain areas in our church. Women are unclean. Uh, uh, there are parishes and dioceses in the United States that won't allow female altar servers, let alone uh, lectors, let alone Eucharistic ministers. So, so there's that um, kind of misogynistic ecclesial memory uh, that's, uh, that's creating uh, difficulty. I've been laughed at um, uh, in the Holy Father's house uh, by priests or bishops uh, who at the suggestion of female deacons, but not a lot of them, okay? And, uh, uh, and I've been well received by the, by the Holy Father's staff and, and by, uh, by others. So uh, I, I think the Holy Father will do what's best for the church uh, at the right time. Now, this may not be the right time, but it may be the right time. So, um, so that's, that's my two cents and I'm sticking to it. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Phyllis, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for being with us tonight and for wonderful questions and insight. Uh, and we have a couple of things we want to let you know about. Um, so, Phyllis, if you want to talk about where you're going to be, and I'll share my screen so that uh, we can kind of see everything you're talking about. Oh, good. Um, well, the link, the link to the Fordham panel is up. Um, the uh, uh, Bernard Poitier and I... Uh, were, uh, we're at Fordham. And uh, if you can find that link or just Google it, uh, we'll be happy. Um, the book, Women Deacons Past, Present, Future, is available in English and in French. Um, so so that, uh, uh, that is available. Uh, the study guide's out in English. It will soon be available in French, and it's for free download on my website. Uh, I'll be at the St. Raphael Center outside of Philadelphia. It's about 10 minutes from uh, Villanova University on April 22nd with another event uh, for women religious and, and all of you participating and, and those who didn't make it uh, will get uh, an invitation to that. I'll be at the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress uh, March 22nd and uh, March 23rd at Santa Clara University on March 25th at Holy Trinity Church in Washington, D.C. on March 30th, at the Catholic University of Portugal in Lisbon uh, on April 10th, and in Hampton, Virginia at the Bishop Keen Institute of Immaculate Conception Church in Hampton, Virginia on uh, Friday, September 13th. So if these, uh, if these are uh, of interest to you, um, even if they're not, um, I, I hope we'll, uh, uh, we'll meet again uh, one, one way or the other. Wonderful. And we're just going to pay, I'm going to paste those links into the chat box. So if anybody wants them to be able to click on or to be able to copy and paste in a Word document or something, because I know they were up there quick and kind of disappeared. So I'm pasting those in right now and we'll see. Yeah, there you go. So if you go over to your chat box, you'll be able to see all of those links and those dates and places uh, where Phyllis will be. So we thank you. It's 8.30, and so uh, we want to keep to the hour, but we thank you so much, Phyllis, for uh, all your knowledge and all your work. So thank you so much for sharing. Well, thank you so much for learning how to work this, uh, this Zoom thing. <laughs> you know? And shout out to Rose and to uh, Catherine Fisher and Alex, Alex Smeros and Monica Yatsilla and half the university for helping me through all this. I appreciate it. So. We'll see you around. Bye-bye. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.